Well, thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the combinatorics of infinite graphs, but from the perspective of descriptive set theory. So the graphs that I'll be interested in are graphs on the reals, and we'll be interested in restricting our attention to definable graphs, but also definable witnesses to combinatorial properties that they have. So we'll be interested in definable coloring or definable matchings. Uh, this sort of study in descriptive set theory is fairly new. It was only maybe around 2000 when, uh, say, for questions about chromatic number, Kekris, Slutsky, and Dorchevich sort of first started systematically studying. Uh, this question of what sort of definable colorings could exist for definable graphs. And there's some, of course, prehistory to the field, but uh, it's turned out to be related to many other questions in descriptive set theory. Ben Miller has uh, a very nice program proving dichotomies in descriptive set theory from combinatorial dichotomies, um, sort of showing how robust say, graphs are for encoding information about other problems in set theory. Uh, there's been uh, some nice connections with ergodic theory and probability. Today, I want to talk about some relationships between problems in this sort of study of descriptive graph combinatorics and paradoxical decompositions. Uh, and I guess I, I might also mention, so recently, uh, Alekos Kekris and I have written an, a survey of sort of this growing field of descriptive graph combinatorics, and we're updating that to try and keep it uh, fairly current, but this is available on, on either of our websites. All right, so th this work uh, is about paradoxical decomposition, sort of it, uh, the most famous of which is, is the Bonnock-Tarski paradox. Here's a general definition. Suppose I have an action A of a group gamma on a space X. So we say that this action has a paradoxical decomposition if you can partition the space into finitely many pieces, and I break those finitely many pieces into two groups, finitely many A sets, finitely many B sets. And you can choose group elements so that after translating these pieces by the group elements, both the first half of the partition can be uh, rearranged to form X, but so can the second half of the partition. Right, so for the Bonnock-Tarski paradox, for example, uh, the relevant group action here is the group of rotations, which act on the unit ball in R3 without the origin. The origin would be a fixed point, so we wouldn't be able to do this. But everywhere else, you can take that unit ball, break it up into finitely many pieces, arrange it just by rotations so that half of the partition can be arranged, rearranged to the full ball, but so can the other half. Okay. Uh, this is the most famous example. Uh, let's look at a simpler one. So take a free group on two generators, and it acts on itself by left translation, just left multiplication. And I can partition the group into four sets. I'm going to call them A1 a negative one, B1, and B negative one, and just based on looking at the first element of each word and uh, what group generator does that begin with. So I can even draw a picture uh, of the sort of decomposition that I have in mind. These four sets, of course, don't include the identity, so I'm not actually giving you a complete example. But if here's F2, And here's the words in F2 that begin with A, and A inverse, and B, and B inverse. Then I say, this is the set B1, this is B minus 1, this is A, this is A minus 1. And now if I take A1 and A times A negative 1, this A and minus A cancel out. And this set of group elements, A times A minus 1, is everything that doesn't begin with A. That's the remainder of the group. If I shift this up, now A and A times A negative 1 partition F2. And similarly with B times B negative 1 and B1. All right, so if, if you allow me to just to discard the identity, here's a paradoxical uh, partition of F2. 
And this can be easily fixed to genuinely give a paradoxical decomposition. It's just slightly more tedious to write out um, the pieces. And it actually, this is very much related to the Bonnock-Tarski paradox. So the way you prove this is you observe that if you take two randomly chosen rotations, they're going to generate a free group on two generators. Okay, and so with the exception of countably many points, each orbit of just those two rotations looks like an action of this form, F2 acting on itself. And so orbit by orbit, you use this paradoxical decomposition to prove the Bonnock-Tarski paradox. Good. So how about a non-example? Let Z act on itself by multiplication on the left. And there's not a paradoxical decomposition of that action. And the reason is uh, there's a finitely additive measure on subsets of Z, which is invariant under uh, the, that group action. So if you define a measure on subsets of Z by letting the measure of an arbitrary set A be the limit of the ratio of the number of points in the interval negative n to n in A. Okay, and of course, a sequence like this is not going to converge in general, but we can take the limit with respect to some ultrafilter, and now it does. And this, indeed, this is really the ultra limit of the finite uniform measures supported on this set. And that is going to be a finitely additive measure that's invariant under this action of Z on itself because if you fix some K and Z and act on this set negative N to N, as N gets very, very large, K shifts this little interval only a tiny bit. And so this measure changes less and less as K is fixed and N goes to infinity. And so this ultra limit doesn't change. So you mean the interval, not the set? Yeah, not the different phase. Uh, yeah, sorry. There are little dots in between, negative end to end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So th this is a, a general phenomenon here. Uh, the existence of a finitely additive translation invariant measure on a group action is uh, the, an action is said to be amenable if this exists. And in fact, it's a theorem of Tarski that that's the existence of such a measure is the only obstruction to a paradoxical decomposition. So a group has a paradoxical decomposition if and only if it doesn't have a finitely additive translation variant measure. And in fact, this construction of a measure is the general construction. You can prove quite easily that if there's not a paradoxical decomposition, you can find appropriate finite measures to take an ultra limit of to get the translation variant measure that you want. Okay. So Here's a descriptive set theoretic question now. How pathological are paradoxical decompositions? So take the Bonnock-Tarski paradox, for example. Uh, obviously, the pieces that you use when you do the paradox can't be Lebesgue measurable because one is not equal to two, and the rotations preserve measure. On the other hand, you could ask, as Mark Zeski did in 1930, could those pieces have the bare property? Okay. Uh, one reason for that, incidentally, is that uh, this question I'll come back to at the end of the talk, what sort of uh, extensions of Lebesgue measure are there, or, or let me say it a different way, what, what sort of finitely additive measures can you have defined on the Lebesgue measurable sets. And this question, one of the reasons for asking that was asking is there something sort of orthogonal to the Lebesgue measure which can concentrate uh, on co-meager sets. But it, it's perfectly natural to ask just the, the general question, can the pieces in such paradox be regular from, from a different view of, of this regularity property, of the bare property? All right, so surprisingly the answer is yes. There is such a paradoxical decomposition and they showed a more general theorem. So if you have a free action of the free group on two generators, which of course was the group action that was sitting behind the proof of the Bonnock-Tarski paradox, and that acts on a Polish space by homeomorphisms, uh, there 
is always a paradoxical decomposition using pieces that have the bare property. So now, quite some years later, uh, we thought it would be interesting to come back to this theorem, which was proved with a, a pretty long ad hoc argument, and see now that we understand a lot more about uh, graph combinatorics from the perspective of descriptive set theory, can we understand the proof a little bit better? So this is where Spencer and I started working. All right, so the main theorem I want to talk about is a generalization of, of this theorem. So here's a quick definition. A group gamma is said to act by Borel automorphisms if each group element acts via Borel map on Polish space. So here's our theorem. Suppose a group acting on a Polish space by Borel automorphisms has a paradoxical decomposition. Then you automatically get one where each piece has the bare property. So this is a very general form of Doherty and Foreman's original theorem. We don't need to assume the group acting is F2. We don't need to assume the actions by homeomorphisms. We don't need to assume the action is free, nothing. Just if there is any paradoxical decomposition and the action is at all definable, then you automatically get a paradoxical decomposition where the pieces have the bare property. Um, we're quite fond of our proof because it's simple, actually. I hope to be able to explain uh, almost all the details, uh, <coughs> modulo the messy stuff, in the talk. Um, and part of the reason it's nice is because we use this language of, uh, of descriptive graph combinatorics. And in particular, there's a nice way of changing paradoxicality problems into matching problems for Borel graphs. And so that's the approach that we take. Right. So I, I want to talk about this equivalence between paradoxicality and matching. So suppose A is an action of a group gamma on a space X, and you have some finite symmetric subset of the group. And you should think of this set as some finite set of group elements that you might consider using to make the paradoxical decomposition of the action. Okay. So I want to define a graph now. And the graph is going to be on three copies of the underlying space where you're acting. Symmetric, I just mean closed under inverses. So you start off with your space X, and now you take three disjoint copies. So 0 cross X, 1 cross X, and 2 cross X. And the edges that I'm going to use in this graph are going to be edges that are between the 0th copy and the other two copies. So the graph is going to be bipartite. You know, we can partition the vertex set into this copy and these two copies of X, and all the edges occur between uh, those two sets. And you say... 0 comma x is related to 1 comma y or 2 comma y if there's a group element in this finite set S that moves x to y. So you just pick this finite piece of the group and you allow yourself to move by those finitely many group elements between this copy of x and these other two copies of x. And that's the graph. Okay. So the claim is this graph has a perfect matching if and only if the action has a paradoxical decomposition using group elements from the finite set S. And hopefully this should be intuitive. You want to biject two copies of X with one copy of X just using this finite set of group elements. And that's what a perfect matching gives you. Right, a, a perfect matching is a subset of the edges of the graph so that each vertex is an incident to precisely one edge from the matching. So it's a bijection between this set and this set using only edges from the graph. Yeah, this is the group elements you're going to use and so it will tell you the number of pieces that you need to use for the paradoxical decomposition. Yeah, so this construction will automatically give us uh, the same number of pieces in both halves. Though I guess when I, I prove this in a second, it's possible that one of the pieces could be empty, in which case you discard it.
Yeah, yeah, it, it's always possible to have, yeah. Okay, so uh, for simplicity, I just want to write down the proof when the action is free. It's the, it's the exact same proof when the action is non-free, but this makes the partition very slightly easier to define. So what's the paradoxical decomposition? What's the partition that I use? So enumerate the group elements in S, call them gamma zero up to gamma n, and suppose you have this perfect matching M, put X into the ith piece of the A partition if X inside this zeroth copy is matched to the first copy and uses the group element gamma i. And likewise, if x is matched to the second copy of x, you put it in the second half of this partition. And then the ith piece where you use the group element gamma i to move from this copy to that copy. All right, so every vertex here is matched to precisely one vertex on the other side. So it's either in 1x or 2x. And so that tells you which half of this two-piece partition it's in. And then the group element is the further refinement into finitely many pieces. And the matching condition is used now to say that we obviously have this partition now of x, but if you take just these sets of points x that are matched to the zeroth copy, you can translate by the group elements which define them to partition x again, right? Because the matching has to match every vertex in this first copy of x. After moving by the group elements that take you from this piece to this piece, you have x again. Okay. And similarly, the second copy of x. Uh, the pieces of this partition that match to here uh, correspond to after moving via these group elements, you rearrange those pieces to get x itself. So this is how matchings and paradoxical decompositions are connected. You make this auxiliary graph and then you just study perfect matchings in this graph. All right, so now we go to the characterization of when a graph has a perfect matching. And uh, there's this very beautiful theorem of Hall, and then the compactness argument that extends it to infinite graphs is due to Rado, a locally finite graph that's bipartite has a perfect matching if the set of neighbors of every finite set is at least as large as the set itself in the graph. So I'm using this notation to indicate uh, neighbors, hoods of this set F in the graph. And of course, this is necessary uh, if you want a bijection, but the, the interesting part of the theorem is that it's sufficient. If you want to construct paradoxical decompositions with the axiom of choice, now you would appeal to this theorem. And you would look, say, inside F2, and it's easy to prove that if you have this graph that you can construct auxiliary to a free F2 action, then you satisfy Hall's condition. And then you're done. It's just finite combinatorics now. Okay. But if we're doing descriptive set theory and we want definable matchings, this doesn't tell us anything about the definability of the matching that we get. And so we need some sort of definable version of Hall's theorem if we want to make matchings that are somehow definable and hence paradoxical decompositions that are somehow definable. So Arnie Miller was the first person to really ask, is there a Borel analog of Hall's theorem? If you have a Borel graph and it satisfies Hall condition, is there going to be a Borel matching, for example? And in fact, in analysis, people had been thinking about similar questions, and Laskovich um, had proven that the answer is no. In fact, something stronger is true, which is a, looks bad for us. There's a graph, a Borel graph, satisfying Hall's condition, but there's no Borel perfect matching. In fact, there's not even generically a perfect matching. There, there's no Borel matching restricted to any Comeager set. Okay. And that's what we'd like. We'd like restricted to some Comeager set to find a definable matching, to do these paradoxical decompositions with the bare property. But the, the analog of Hall's theorem which is what we want to use now, just doesn't hold true, even in this bare category context. Okay. Uh, it turns out, though, if we strengthen Hall's condition a tiny little bit, we can save 
the matching theorem in the bare category context. So this is the main ingredient that we use to find these bare measurable paradoxical decomposition. Suppose G is a locally finite bipartite Borel graph, and instead of having at least as many neighbors uh, of each finite set F as the size of F, we have at least one plus epsilon times as many neighbors. And epsilon is fixed as F varies. And somehow this is enough to find Borel perfect matchings modulo omega set in any Borel bipartite graph. Okay, and of course, Laskovich's example uh, shows that we can't improve epsilon to zero. Actually, maybe it's worth, uh, very briefly, if you want a beautiful little exercise in bare category, I can tell you what Laskovich's example is. It's very simple. You take the graph where you have two copies of the unit interval, and now I'm going to just draw the graph in 0, 1 cross 0, 1. So you take a rectangle like this, and you choose this slope here, or I can just say define it by alpha here. And this should, I guess, be 1 minus alpha, though I don't quite have right angles. Alpha rational. So that defines a graph. Each point here will be connected to two points in the other copy of 0, 1. Uh, and it's a nice exercise to prove commingerly there's not a Braille perfect match in here. So in, in some sense, our theorem is optimal. You need some amplification of Hall's theorem to get uh, a result like this, or of Hall's condition. Yeah, okay, so it would be nice, in general, you can ask, suppose G is such a graph, can you characterize when you're going to generically have a perfect matching? And you would hope that sort of there, there's a dichotomy theorem saying there's certain obstructions. And this would be an obstruction. In fact, we really don't know of any others that aren't built out of or related to this in some, in some setting. So though I will ask an open question at the end version of your question, can you prove a dichotomy theorem? It looks close in certain cases for graphs generated by group actions in a nice way. It doesn't look that far off to prove a theorem essentially saying this is the only obstruction to generically finding perfect matchings. But the general question looks quite hard. Uh, Clinton Conley and Ben Miller have done something for acyclic graphs, giving a dichotomy. But acyclic is quite a special case. All right. So I want to talk about how you use bare category in proving this, uh, this version of Hall's theorem. So we, we use it only in this very nice sort of black boxy way. Suppose you have some function from omega to omega, you have this graph, I can partition the vertex set of the graph into countably many sets A sub n, so that their union is co-meager. But each set A sub n has the property that points in A n are pairwise of distance at least F n. So each set A n is a subset of the vertex set of the graph, but points inside it are far apart, farther apart than this arbitrary function F that you pick. So for example, if you had the axiom of choice, a locally finite graph, so each point has finitely many neighbors, has countable connected components. So you could just take one point out of each connected component, and obviously you have this condition. Measure theoretically, you can't do this. And the reason is there's some relationship between how sparse a set in a graph is, in a, in a nice measure-preserving graph, and how large the measure of the set is. So as F grows, this union would have to have smaller and smaller measure. But in the bare category context, this is a very easy lemma to prove. And I can, I can give the proof on the slide. So enumerate a basis of open sets for the, the vertex set of the graph. And I'm going to define sets which I'll call B sub IR. And this is the collection of sets at, or points X. So that X is in the ith open set. But if I look at all the neighbors in the closed R ball around X, they're not in the ith open set. 
Okay, so I'm just sort of taking the ith open set and I'm saying points in that ith open set whose R neighborhood is not in the ith open set. Okay. And every X is in at least one of these BIRs because you can separate that R ball around X from X by one of these open sets. Open sets separate points in this Polish space. Uh, but furthermore, since X is in that ith open set, but its R ball isn't, these sets are R discrete. Two points in BIR have to be distance greater than R apart. So these are an, an, a really nice and easy way of defining sets where point-wise you have to have distance at least R, uh, but countably many of them color, cover the vertex set of the graph. So abstractly, we, we could appeal to some uh, more powerful stuff in, in the theory of, of descriptive graph combinatorics. We could just say, well, abstractly, there's a theorem here of Kekrasleski to Dorchevich coloring the powers of G. But uh, this is shorter than writing down that theorem and then appealing to it. All right. So we're ready to finish. Now just use the bare category theorem. So what should AN be? AN should be one of these sets. And pairwise distance at least f of n apart. So I should use the f of nth uh, partition into these sets bi. And how should I pick the i? Which bi should I choose? I should use bi so that AN is non-meager in the nth open set. And here I'm just using the trick that if you're not meager inside every open set, you have to be co-meager. And so if I arrange the construction this way, once I take the union, then I'm finished. So that's it. That's the only way in which I use bare category in the theorem. You can break up uh, an arbitrary locally finite Braille graph into countably many sets, each of which is arbitrarily or has a sparseness that you've specified in advance. Okay. So I want to talk now about how you construct perfect matchings. And what I want to do first is I want to prove Hall's theorem for you and then sort of generalize the idea to prove our version for bare category. But let's start off with the easy thing. Let's start off by sketching a proof of Hall's theorem. So let G be a finite graph. Suppose it satisfies Hall's condition. And I want to construct a matching. So, of course, for me, wanting to generalize this, what's important is figuring out some construction that works uh, well. Here's an example of a finite graph that satisfies Hall's theorem. And in particular, I don't mind assuming Hall's theorem to prove it, as long as this gives me a nice, uh, nice algorithm for constructing matchings. So assume Hall's theorem is true. Um, since G satisfies Hall's condition, there's a perfect matching. Okay. Take such a matching of the graph, so maybe I pick this edge, this edge, this edge, and this edge, and now pick one of the edges from the perfect matching and keep it. So this is going to be part of my perfect matching. All right, now I can delete it from the graph. I have a smaller graph, and there's a perfect matching of it, right? The complement of this edge of, of that perfect matching still perfectly matches the remaining graph. So the remaining graph satisfies Hall's condition. Okay, good, that's my inductive process. Now I find a different perfect matching of the graph that remains. I remove one of the edges. What's left still satisfies Hall's condition, and so I can keep going. Okay. I mean, there's, you don't see this proof in graph theory textbooks uh, <laughs> for an obvious reason, but, but this is the right thing to generalize. This is the right way for us of constructing perfect matchings. You iteratively remove pieces that, are, that come from perfect matchings. We have to do this now in a definable way, though. Are there any questions about <laughs> the idea? <laughs> a good edge to remove from a graph, if you want to make a matching of it, is an edge that comes from a matching. That's the idea. So do you remove just the edge, not the vertices? Yeah, you, sh you should remove the edge, but also the two vertices incident on the edge. 
So the next, the smaller finite graph that you're going to use in this inductive construction is going to be now this graph. So I also get rid of any, the two vertices, the edge, and any edges that were to those two vertices that I removed. And now if, say, I use, uh, all right, let's add a few more. Now if I use this edge in the perfect matching, I should remove that edge, but also any edges incident to these vertices. So I'd remove this and this, and I'd be left with something uh, like that. Good. So I'll at least sketch the idea for how you do the bare category version. So suppose G is a Borel graph, it's bipartite, and satisfies this strength inversion of Hall's condition. So you have this extra epsilon of room. So I want some process for making partial matchings that will eventually make a full matching of the graph. So choose a Braille set M of edges of very large pairwise distance so that each edge individually comes from a matching of the graph. They don't come from the same matching globally. Just for each edge, I need to know that it's a good edge. It comes from a perfect matching of the graph. And so it, it's, there's an easy uniformization argument that I can find such sets and they can be Borel. Good. So I want to remove that set of edges now. I have no guarantee about what happens. I have to argue now that I still have something resembling Hall's condition. And then that's the idea. Uh, I mean, to, yeah. The, the distance between two edges is the shortest path connecting vertices incident on them. So, yeah, so I mean, what really happens here is that I I have some set of vertices that has large pairwise distance. For each vertex in the set, I pick some edge to match it to that comes from matching. That's where I use the uniformization theorem. And then the resulting set of edges is far apart because it comes from matching vertices that are pairwise far apart. Okay, and now consider the graph that I get after removing that set of edges. Okay, and I want to argue that I still have not only Hall's condition, but something resembling this again. And then that's how the induction goes. Okay. So now, actually, there's two cases. You have to argue differently from sets that are small and sets that are large. For small sets, our, our iterative induction hypothesis that works is that for small sets, you have Hall's condition. For sufficiently large sets, you have this amplified version of Hall's condition. And that's what you push through the induction. The idea is that small sets have to satisfy Hall's condition because if you're small enough, you only are incident to one edge that I matched. And so since that single edge came from a perfect matching, you can still match uh, what remains, and so you, the, the set of neighbors still has to be large enough. If you're big enough to touch several edges that I removed, you're big enough so that the set of edges that I removed is really sparse. And so this giant epsilon just gets reduced a tiny bit. And so at the next step, you have Hall's condition for sufficiently large sets. You satisfy this for a slightly smaller epsilon. So I mean, this is condensing a page of very careful counting arguments into an idea. But the idea is after removing a sparse set, small sets are only close to one edge. So they still are fine for Hall's condition. Large sets have only a small fraction of points removed from them because the set of edges I removed are very far apart. And so I just slightly weaken this strong version of false condition. And then the lemma I proved about bare category says I can iteratively do this, but still at the end win on a co-meager set, even keeping things far apart. So I just choose sets M to remove of edges that are farther and farther apart. And that's how the argument works. No, no, no. The, the point is you have this sparse set of vertices. I mean, this is getting more into the details. The sparse set of vertices A sub n coming from the lemma. For each vertex, you associate to it the set of vertices so that if it was matched to them, that matching could be extended to Hall's condition. You need to check that that is Borel. It's Borel because of Hall's theorem. You say that the edge comes from a matching if after you delete it, every finite set still satisfies Hall's condition. You don't ask for the existence of a matching, which would be uh, a real quantifier. It doesn't matter how small that epsilon is. Right, it doesn't matter how small that is. 
And then you just use uniformization on, I guess, uh, real relations with finite sections, which is really easy. I mean, it's true for conical sections as well. Yeah. So th that's the idea of the construction. Okay. Th there's a problem, though. Okay, so here's the Borel version, or, or the, the bare category version of Hall's theorem. And what we want to say is, well, look, there's a paradoxical decomposition of the action, so I can find this associated graph uh, that has a perfect matching. Where are we? Yeah. So abstractly, I want to say, suppose the action's paradoxical. I can find this graph. This graph is nicely definable, right? Because the action is in the finite set. It's just finite and it has a, a perfect matching. And now I want a perfect matching with the bare property. But the existence of a perfect matching here doesn't give me this strengthened version that I need. I know there's a perfect matching, so sets of neighbors are at least as large as f, but I need to somehow magically gain an epsilon. So the last piece of the puzzle is a trick, so that in this particular context, I can somehow find an epsilon. And it's this nice amplification trick. So suppose now you have this action and it's paradoxical so you can find this finite set that does the paradoxical decomposition and hence this graph has a perfect matching. So it satisfies Hall condition. The idea is to amplify by taking the set of products of elements in S. So you take S squared and I claim now that if you take, if you enlarge the set of group elements that way, if you take the squares then of S, then I have Hall's condition with a 2 in it. Right, so my epsilon is going to be equal to 1. And I guess I, I deleted the, or I, I erased the picture here, but the idea is that if you have Hall's condition in GAS, and so you can go from here to here and keep the size of the set the same, when you enlarge by S squared, you can think about neighborhoods in this graph as taking neighborhoods twice in the original graph. And one of the times you automatically increase in size by two because you split X into two copies of X. And you have at least one group element in the set S. So, so here's the actual uh, careful argument. If you have a set of the form that's in the zeroth part of X, so zero times F prime, Obviously, you have uh, at least one group element, and so it has neighbors that include 1, 2 times f prime. So you're done. So the hard part is that if you have some finite set f of the form 1, 2 times f prime. So why does that enlarge by a factor of 2 after you take the neighbors in this larger graph, g a s squared? Uh, so the reason is, again, taking the neighborhood in this original graph and calling it zero times f double prime. Once you take the neighborhood in the s squared graph, it's the neighbor of this set, f prime, uh, which is the neighbor in this smaller graph uh, of this set of the same size as f, but there's two copies of it, so you get two times f. Okay. So it's easy to check the details, but the, the picture is Take a finite set here. Use the original graph with S. Its set of neighbors here is the same size. And now the neighborhood of this and the original graph back in here corresponds to the size of the neighborhood uh, in the S squared graph. But now when you come back, you enlarge by factor two. All right, so that's the proof. Suppose you have a paradoxical action. So you can find some associated finite set of group elements so that this has a perfect matching. It satisfies Hall's condition. Our amplification trick says you satisfy Hall's condition with a factor of two on F. So now you can apply our version of Hall's theorem for bare category to find a bare measurable, or rather a Borel perfect matching on a Comeager set. Use choice to finish and extend that to a perfect matching on the whole space, but you'll still have the bare property since you're Borel in some Comeager set with each of the pieces, and that's it, you're done. All right. And it's cheating slightly, there's some invariances that you need to check, but it's not a big deal. All right. 
So there's a nice little note here. Our proof amplifies the number of pieces we need. If you start with a number of pieces which is related to the set of group elements S you use, we had to go to F squared to find enough pieces to make this bare measurable version work. And that's known to be necessary in general. So uh, Veron had proved that even though you can do the Bonnartarsky paradox uh, with four pieces, with the choice, you need at least six pieces if you want the pieces to have the bare property. So somewhere you had to do some sort of amplification like this. Great. Yeah, that's right. For us, we're squaring the number of pieces. Uh, it's only a recent theorem that, uh, so there's something called the Tarski number of an action. It's the smallest number of pieces that are required to do a paradoxical decomposition. Uh, it's only recently known that, say, the Tarski numbers of groups can be arbitrarily large. Um, you could ask about bare measurable Tarski numbers. But, uh, in general, they have to be larger, but I don't know anything about what's optimal there. So uh, I'll mention quickly, so, sort of simultaneously, uh, some combinatorialists were thinking about equidecomposability problems. And they used some arguments, ideas, going to definable graph matching theorems to prove results about equidecomposability. And they proved a, a really nice theorem using sort of the same set of tricks. So work in R cubed, we know we can do the Bonnachtarsky paradox. Uh, with from choice, but if we want, say, Lebesgue measurable pieces now instead of bare measurable pieces, whenever I do any sort of equity composition, it has to be between pieces that have the same measure, okay, if you want Lebesgue measurable pieces. So their theorem says really that's the only obstruction. So if you have two sets in R3, they're bounded, they have non-empty interior in the same measure, you can equity decompose one to the other using pieces that are Lebesgue measurable. And they use a theorem of Lyons and Nazarov on Lebesgue measurable matchings that looks very much like uh, Spencer and, and my theorem on bare measurable matchings. You have the same sort of amplification of Hall's theorem by some fixed constant. Okay, and for their particular application to R3, they need to use the spectral gap in SO3 to, to get that amplification. All right. So, uh, I want to talk about another application of these ideas. So a group is said to be non-amenable if the translation action of the group on itself has a paradoxical decomposition. So for example, the free group on two generators is non-amenable. And so there had been a question, uh, since every subgroup of an amenable group is amenable, you might wonder is F2 the only reason for being non-amenable? Okay, so suppose you're a non-amenable group. If you contain F2 as a subgroup, since F2 is non-amenable, your group's non-amenable. Right? If you were an amenable group, this subgroup would be amenable. So any group containing F2 is automatically non-amenable. Is that a characterization of non-amenability? Certainly all the, all the classical paradoxes that people had used about paradoxical decompositions, they used the fact that whatever group was acting, they found some copy of F2 sitting inside. So in fact, the answer uh, to this problem, which was called the von Neumann day problem, uh, turned out to be negative. So there are non-amenable groups that do not contain F2 as a subgroup. And uh, Olshansky proved this uh, by showing certain Tarski monsters are non-amenable. Uh, so the Tarski monsters are these groups that are infinite, but every proper subgroup is finite. I guess the, the methods that he used to prove this are very much like the method Shalaw had used earlier to construct a monster, a group of size omega-1, where every proper subgroup is countable. So it's using the same sort of small cancellation trick. Um, but this situation is uh, somewhat unsatisfying. Like, it, it would have been so nice if we knew F2 is the only reason for non-amenability. And people, in fact, wish so hard for that to be true that we still try and prove theorems to that effect. We'd like to know something is non-amenable because somehow there's some related F2 action that's doing 
the non embeddability for us. Um, I mean, the Tarski monsters are hard objects to understand. Uh, and so people had sort of weakened in this problem the notion of subgroup. That was the, the attempted fix. So maybe you don't have F2 as a subgroup, but maybe F2 is in some way very closely related to this non-amenable group or this non-amenable action, <coughs> and that's somehow creating the non-amenability. So there had been a, proof, uh, a theorem proved like this by White in the context of geometric group theory, um, where you use uh, quasi-isomorphism. Gabor Alliance had proved some version in measured group theory, and we have sort of a bare category version of this phenomena. So I, I need a quick definition. Suppose A and B are actions of gamma and delta on some space. Then the action B is said to be Lipschitz with respect to A if every group element uh, acts via some choice of only finitely many group elements uh, in the action A. So you can approximate sort of uh, each group element in the B action up to finitely many elements in the A action. Okay. So that, that's the definition of one ap action being Lipschitz with respect to another. Here's our theorem. Suppose you have a paradoxical action. Suppose you have a non abandonable action of a group gamma on a Polish space by Borel automorphisms, then there's a free action which is Lipschitz with respect to your original of F2 by bare measurable automorphisms. Okay. And for example, it's really easy to see since we know F2 actions, say by the doherty forman theorem, have bare measurable paradoxical decompositions. Since each group action in the, so, sorry, since each group element in the F2 action is a, acts by just finitely many group elements in the original action, you can transfer a paradoxical decomposition of the F2 action to a paradoxical decomposition of this action. So in some satisfying way, even in this definable setting, any non-amenable action is a result of some related free F2 action um, that's creating the non-amenability. Okay. So uh, I want to mention a few open problems now. So here's a theorem of uh, Margulis and Sullivan in dimensions at least four and Drinfeld in two and three. Very nice theorem LeBake measures the unique finitely additive measure, which is rotation invariant, and defined on the LeBake measurable sets, on the ends here. Okay. So, uh, of course, this is a fantastic result, but they are cheating a little bit. They, they want to get this answer, right? You want to know LeBake measures unique, that's rotation invariant and finitely additive, and the way they're cheating is they're, they're using the right sigma algebra, right? So it would be nicer because if you have uh, an arbitrary measure, it should just be well defined on the Borel sets, right? If you want some nice measure on, on the n sphere, making it defined on the Lebesgue measurable sets helps you a lot in proving this result. And so th the strengthening where you say, I'm only going to assume my measures are defined on Borel sets remains an open problem. So uh, I think this would be a very nice strengthening of the theorem. You're, you're getting rid of the only slightly unnatural piece that they're assuming. You're not begging the question as much. And uh, the results we've proved have uh, maybe some application here. So first of all, using their work, it's enough to prove this to be true just to show that every Le borel lebesgue null set is contained in some larger borel lebesgue null set that has a Borel paradoxical decomposition. So this becomes now a question again of definable graph combinatorics. You have these graphs that we make that tell you about paradoxical actions. You want Borel matchings of them now, assuming they have nice geometrical properties, assuming the graph comes from this Borel null set that's, and the graph is defined with this nice geometrical action. Okay. And so, for example, it would be sufficient, based on how we prove our theorem, to decompose an arbitrary borel lebesgue null set into countably many sparse sets. Okay. And ho hopefully you can use some geometry of these actions on the ends here to do that. But um, this remains open. 
All right. Uh, and I also mentioned this dichotomy. We would like to understand the extent to which you can push uh, these techniques for making bare measurable matching. So can you characterize when a locally finite Braille graph has a bare measurable perfect matching? And Clinton Conley and, and Ben Miller, as I mentioned, have done acyclic graphs. Um, for graphs generated by group actions, uh, it doesn't look that far away uh, or that hopeless because, uh, say, our, our theorem applies to non-amenable uh, actions of groups that are bipartite, or that have bipartite Cayley graphs, and in, in general, um, sort of, the, this is still uh, maybe a, not quite fully written, but we're, we're quite confident that if you have a, uh, a graph generated from a free action of an arbitrary non-amenable group, uh, then you find a perfect matching of the associated graph on some Comega Borel set. So if, if you want the dichotomy, it suffices, we hope, just to consider the amenable actions. Uh, if the graphs that you want to consider are, are nice in this sense. All right, so I'll end there. Thanks very much. So the exact value is known in both contexts. So if you, if you assume the axiom of choice, if you want, say, the full Bonnock-Tarski paradox, where you um, do translations and rotations, and you want to reassemble to get two pieces, um, in R3 you need five pieces under the axiom of choice. Um, and with bare measurable pieces, it's known that you need at least six, and Doherty and Foreman's construction actually gives six exactly. Um, but in general, the problem is open. No, well, for actions here of, of non-amenable groups that are that are arbitrary, say free actions of Tarski monsters, what what can you say? And the answer is probably that it's quite a hard problem. Well, okay, so, so there's two things you could mean, I suppose. Of course, you have to fill in with choice after you do our construction. So the sets aren't nicely definable at all. But if you just want to, say, restrict yourself to some Comega Borel null set, how complicated do the pieces have to be? I haven't checked, but I, I, I'm pretty confident that you can choose G, of course, to be G delta. And I imagine that our pieces all also live at the second level of the Borel hierarchy. In, in general, these constructions give very, very low sets in, in the Borel hierarchy, and that's not unusual for the study of, uh, you know, locally finite graphs in, in Borel combinatorics or, say, countable equivalence relations. The, the reductions, the objects themselves are all fairly low in the Borel hierarchy. What, what is hard, um, say, is determining whether they exist or not. If they do, they tend to be of low complexity.